TLO, what's poppin'? We are on Twitch. We are not live. But you can leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK. Right behind me. You see it? Premier League time. Season started last week. And trust and believe me, the highlights, I am watching them on Patreon. Links down below in the description. Um, talk to me though. This is this is uh, soccer explained for Americans. So I've been wanting to start following soccer for a while now, but as an American, I always found it complicated. Not like how they play. Most three-year-olds can kind of understand more or less how it works. I just mean how everything kind of works in Europe. You know, I would follow the World Cup, and I'd root for the United States if they made it. And then I'd root for Iceland because clearly they've all been practicing that clapping and they're really good at it. But that only happens once every four years. So I turn on my TV and it would be a, like a random game like Parma versus Bologna. And first I'd make sure that I wasn't watching the Food Network. But then I had no frame of reference for this game. Like, are these teams good? You know, is this a big game? Which one of these guys is Pele? You know, I, I didn't know. And I had all these other questions, you know, why, why are teams getting kicked out of leagues? Why are they all rolling around on the ground so much? How are guys getting traded to different countries? And why, why does everybody in the stands have a scarf? So a few <laughs> months ago, I tried to start figuring it all out. And I started watching some matches. That's the first thing. They aren't soccer games. They are football yeah, matches. matches. Yeah. And I bought FIFA for my Xbox. And I bought a scarf and a Vuvuzela because... Don't forget, man, I will be having FIFA 25 this year. I'm playing it on the PC um, I'm going to be watching it on Twitch. I mean, I'm going to be playing it on Twitch, and I'm also upload a little video or two on here as well. That's like the rules or something. So anyway, this is all the info that I wish I'd known a year ago. This is my crash course of translating soccer into American. Talk to me. I'm going to assume that you kind of know the rules. The biggest difference between American sports is how offsides works and the clock. Lots of people get upset about the clock. It goes up instead of down. Get over yourself. It doesn't really matter. The thing I noticed about the clock in the uh, Premier League or in football is um, it does not stop. And, like, the refs, you don't have to give the ref the ball and then they give it back to you to start a play, to throw it in bounds or something like that. Like, if the ref blow the whistle and you know what go next, you go next and you just keep going. I love that. I love that. It doesn't take away from the game. The refs doesn't slow the game down or anything like that. I like that. Americans also get mad because the clock doesn't stop and games pretty much end whenever like the ref that. feels like it. And you actually adjust to this pretty quickly. The game's an hour and a half long. You'll have your chances to score. And if you can't score, then it's not the clock's fault. Some people, and, and when I say people, I'm referring both to discussions I've had with other Americans as well as like myself six years ago. So people think soccer is too slow. And when Americans look at a soccer field, something in our minds, we think that it's like playing hockey or playing basketball just on a big grass field. I understand that the, 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 grill, the field, the pitch is bigger than, than a basketball court, but a lot of this stuff is the same. Passing, assisting, scoring, shooting, blocking, uh, even some of the plays like they like I seen somebody when I was watching the highlights on Patreon today. Link down in the description. I seen somebody do the nastiest give and go. Brought it up the right side. Did some type of move, passed it behind him. The defender spent the wrong way and looked, but he cut right behind him, passed it back to him, scored. I was like, you idiot! How does that happen to you? And in those sports, guys like go full tilt a lot, like most of the game. So when two players are just standing there passing the ball back and forth, we wonder, like, why aren't they trying to move forward? Just go. And on the other side, we expect the defenders to be attacking the guy with the ball rather than just standing five feet back and letting him do what he's doing. The key difference is that soccer fields are much, sorry, football pitches are much larger than basketball courts and hockey rinks. And if you Damn, it's that much bigger? Golly. Try to full court press for the whole soccer game. You would be exhausted and you would probably lose. See, the, the pace of a soccer game is actually much closer to baseball. Most of the game is going to consist of guys just slowly passing the ball around, real peaceful. And then it's going to be all of a sudden followed by these short bursts of extremely fast action. 
Basketball players, it's estimated, run an average of two and a half miles during a game. Soccer players can run seven, if not ten miles during one game. That's and remember, ridiculous. you only have three subs a game, so most of these players will be playing the whole game. One thing Americans will appreciate is that other than halftime, there are no commercials. So it's like the anti-NFL, which is great. It also means that no matter where the ball is, both teams are always potentially about 30 seconds away from 10 miles? Scoring, which creates this kind of constant. That's what I noticed, though. When I was watching the highlights, I was like, bro, whoever's conditioned better is probably going to win. Because think about it. Think about this. If you're running 10 miles and all of a sudden, at the end of the game, you've run 10 miles total. And all of a sudden, there's one last sprint. It's still 0-0. You're a defender and I'm an uh, offensive player. Like, you have to catch me. And I'm going, I'm, I'm in shape. I'm ready for this. And you just a little bit out of shape. You just you in shape, but you're just not as conditioned as me. I'm gonna get a took couple steps on you, and boom, I'm scored. I've scored. Condition matters. Man. Tension. It also creates a scenario where you can't ever really run to the bathroom or get a drink. Soccer players seem to have a reputation for being lazy in the U.S. because they don't always pop right back up after going to ground and get right back in the play. Certainly, some players do embellish things, and some go over the top. But I don't really think that on the whole, it's I quite the that. issue that people make it out to be. So they get made fun of in Europe too. So here's a fun experiment to try the next time. Loads you of flopping. You have a few minutes. Land Go to like a local field and then quickly jog laps around that field for like 10 minutes. And then suddenly sprint down the middle of the field as fast as you can. And when you're halfway up the field, while you're still sprinting, have one of your friends just shove you over onto the ground. And if you can pop right back up and keep sprinting, then you can keep... That actually makes sense. See... I wasn't even playing into it like like they resting. Both of them running ten miles in a game. They resting when they're embellishing and they're laying there and they're rolling around screaming and faking and they're just getting a little rest and they putting on for the rest of their team to get a rest as well. That's actually salutable. W T mate. Complaining about those guys. A lot of the time they're just taking a little rest and everyone will either just keep playing around them or or both teams will be a little tired, so who cares? It's not a Matthew Riley novel out there. The other reason for guys slowly passing the ball around is that one of the strategies currently employed by most teams is to just to maintain possession as much as possible. Obviously, this is no different. That's boring. Uh, when I was watching highlights today on Patreon, link down in the description, go check it out. Um, you know what team highly did that a lot in the Premier League? Man City. Man City. Pass, 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 pass. Then give it to the big dude with the ponytail with the ball sides, and he would move people out of the way and go score. Yeah, this is a boring strategy, but I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that it doesn't work because it obviously does, man. Time of possession matters in sports, you know in American football or why Russia is really good at hockey. The other team can't score when you have the ball. So exactly. teams will just pass the ball back and forth and even pass it back to their own goalie because it's better to go backwards with the ball than to maybe make a risky pass and let the other team have the ball. On occasion, you'll see a team make like 50 passes without the other team touching the ball, which can take a really long time, but then they'll go down and they'll score and that's like as good as it gets. It's all about waiting for the precise moment for things to align and then all going together at the right moment. In terms of like positioning and formations, you'll usually have three or four numbers, like four, four. Wait, 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 this is important. See, now I, I was seeing them run, I was seeing them on the highlights. They was telling me what formations teams was in and I didn't understand it. So this has helped me. Four, two, or four, three, three, or four, two, three. A lot of people were running this, four, two, three, one. Or they were running one, three, something like that. I don't know. You want. These numbers will always add up to 10, and then the goalie is just assumed. Different positions include the center backs, who just stay as defenders, and then the full backs are both the left and the right back, who will defend, but then they'll also usually join the attack as well. And then we have midfielders, like a center midfielder, who can go both ways. Um, a center attack. Pause. Center midfielder can go both ways. Am I childish? My fault. Hacking midfielder or a center defending midfielder. 
And then up front, we have like a left wing and a right wing, sometimes a center forward and a striker up front who will, it's his job to just score goals. So somebody in the comments when I was watching this on Patreon, link down in the description for the highlights, um, they were telling me the goalie doesn't get blamed when there's a defensive lapse and somebody scores. These two right here, these two right here get blamed. They get blamed. Which I feel like the goalie, I mean, now knowing the rules and knowing the position, like, it's okay. All right, that makes sense. They're supposed to stay back and play defense. So if they're out of the box doing something they're not supposed to do, that leaves it open for more opportunity for the score, which makes sense. And these left back, right back, they can go help. They can help. Everybody can score here. Striker's the main person, though. One thing I'll mention that makes it easy to kind of get into soccer is that you can watch, legally watch, some old matches on YouTube. Um, this is unlike American sports. Like, why isn't there a website that I can go to to watch any game, like an iTunes for sports? So, like, That's, I can pay $2 yes. to watch any game in history. Like, all these games are on tape somewhere. They exist. But I can't watch a game in the 1986 World Series unless an international pandemic shuts down the world and there's no sports. And I just happen to put it on NBC or something. Like, come on. So anyway, um, so keeping the ball and attacking is referred to as positive football. You're always trying to move forward. This is what most teams do. This is what people like to watch a little more. Arsenal. Arsenal. I watched Arsenal today. I mean, the highlights. Very exciting brand of football. What's that dude? Kiki, the black dude? The, he plays the... What position was that? Not the striker, but the outside. Buddy is nice. He's nice. Boy was involved in every single attempt at the net. He scored, he assisted, but he was nice. And he left-handed, so he's crazy. It's harder to guard somebody with that when they left-handed and you're used to guarding people with the right hand. It's, tough. it's kind of exciting. It's more exciting to watch that way. But, of course, there's always a yin to the yang. So the yin is this guy named Jose Mourinho. And he basically says, I don't want the ball. I'm going to stand back with my players in front of my goal, and you're not going to score. And then every once in a while, when you're falling asleep and all your players are up in my zone, we're going to steal the ball and we're going to run down and score. Seems like a good strategy, Loki. Defense another team to sleep, and then when they board, pew! Which sounds a little bit risky, except that it actually does work if you do it well. Jose's considered one of the best managers there is, and he has the trophies to back it up. He's won plenty of big tournaments with teams. Then I'm told if you tried to have that team keep the ball the whole time, like most coaches would, they would have been destroyed. They were too old, and they just would have got worn out and wiped out. But but by playing this negative defensive strategy, they were able to win. And despite this, teams that employ the strategy seem to get a bad rap for playing negative as opposed to positive football because keeping the ball seems to be the end thing right now. So obviously there's more thought that goes into into it than I've described here. Like Diego Simeone and Atletico Madrid has been using this negative strategy for years, and they've been successful with it. On the flip side, the guys who've risen to the top playing possession football are also widely sought after. Two of the most well-known coaches right now are Jurgen Klopp and Pep Guardiola. And I highly recommend watching the series All or Nothing about Manchester City on Amazon Prime. It's about Guardiola's team a few years ago. And it's, it's quite clear from interviews with these guys that they're you know, quite thoughtful and well-traveled. I couldn't name a single baseball manager who can speak three languages. So speaking of Manchester City, they play in England. There are four main football countries in Europe. There's Is Man City the most hated football team in the, in the Premier League? They got if they're the most hated, they gotta be the most loved too, because people hate. They love to they 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 love to hate the most loved team. England, Spain, Germany, and Italy. England has the Premier League. Spain has La Liga. Germany oh, has the Bundesliga, and Italy has Serie A. Never heard of Serie A or Bundesliga. Oh, I wanted to ask y'all. Somebody said I could react to. The Germans League, Bundesliga, Bundesliga, and not have no issues on YouTube. I feel like that's cap. I feel like I do not believe that. And I'm going to continue to not believe that until somebody proves it. <laughs> so to take one country, they're all the same, but to take one country, England, the Premier League consists of 20 teams 
every team plays every other team once at home and once away. And these leagues don't have playoffs. You get three points for a win, one for a tie. The team with the most points at the end of the season wins. And this can't. Three points for a win, three, two. I guess. I guess. I mean, I guess, right? But what if you obviously just suck? What if you lo tie all your games or lose all your games? You know what I'm saying? What happens at that point? And, and has come down to the final day of the season before. In the U.S., our leagues pretty much have the same teams every year. So if you suck, and even if you start to lose on purpose, you actually get rewarded with the top draft pick the next year. Which is stupid. If you finish in last place in one of these leagues, they literally kick you out of the league. But they call it relegation because that's a nicer sounding word. So if you trash on this... <laughs> hey, if you trash, get out. Get out. We're not going to keep rewarding you with this money, with this TV money. Get out. Get out. Do better. Replace the coach. Replace the manager. Replace some team, the players. And get, come back next year. Trash ass. <laughs> That's funny. Before we keep going, here's a quick aside on the MLS. Major League Soccer is the top league in the United States. Don't watch. It's different in many ways than the European leagues. There's no relegation, so the teams do stay the same from year to year. And there is a salary cap. No, I like Talent-wise, I guess globally speaking, it seems to be an okay league, but certainly not on par with any of the European leagues. So under the Premier League, which is at the top, under them is a league called the English Football League Championship. The three teams who finish at the bottom of the Premier League are relegated to the championship for the next season and replaced by three. Three teams go? But also three teams get replaced, rewarded for being good. I mean, that's good, though. Keeps it interesting. Keeps people, like, fully involved with their team. Like, oh, my God, you suck. Three teams from the championship. Now. The bottom three teams in the championship are relegated to League One. The bottom three in League One are relegated to League Two, whose losers go to the National League, whose losers are... Um, no, nobody really cares about them except their moms at this part. But you get... What? Has there ever been a team put for, like, a team to drop from all the way to the Premier League all the way down to whatevers? I, I would be... I couldn't see it. I know certain teams are just too prestigious. You know what I'm saying? And like vice versa. Has there ever been a team to go from what else to, to the Premier League? That'd be a crazy documentary, movie, whatever they make it. Get the idea. Unless you really get into the soccer, you'll never hear about anything below the Premier League again. But just so you're aware of what's happening down there. This system does a few things. First off, just because you're near the bottom of the standings, your games can still be extremely important. They still count because you're not trying to win the league anymore, but now you're trying to stay literally in stay in the league. Good. Because when you, when, when you suck and you tanking to, get, to draft the best player like American sports do, it gets boring. It gets unfair to the fan. This way, like, there's, everything is fair. You can't just suck. Can't skip games. You gotta be good, kinda. You gotta be relatively good enough to not be out of the. You gotta, you gotta go and compete every night. Is what I'm saying. There you go. And the higher the league you're in, the higher the check you get from TV contracts. So it's kind of a big deal. It also creates this kind of theoretical meritocracy where you could start a team with a bunch of guys anywhere in the country, get into a kind of a tiny league, and then ultimately work your way up to the Premier League. In reality, that'd yeah, be like right. trying to take a single-A baseball team and work your way up to the majors while the other better teams with bigger pocketbooks are trying to buy all your best right. players the whole way. But for the teams at the top, just winning the Premier League sounds pretty easy. You're, you're playing maybe one game a week. To go from bottom to top, you would really have to preach loyalty. You would really have to have a brotherhood. Like, and even at that, you know what I'm saying? Teams can just get negative. Like, hey, listen, I got a bag. You going to come to me or not? I'm trying to buy you. Come on. Your family, your kids can go to private school. And a player like me, if I was playing, which I probably could at some point back in the day, um, um, I'm gone. But that's the catch. There's other things going on here. So there's also the Carabao Cup, which is a tournament 
open to the top four leagues in England. And then there's the FA Cup, which has been going on since like forever, that it's literally open to every like team in England. So over 700 teams entered this one tournament last year. Like imagine if every major and minor league baseball team had one giant tournament. So could any team win? Yes, they could. Will the small teams upset the bigger teams? At some point, maybe a few will. But is it likely that a non-Premier League team is going to win? No, probably not. No. So more fun. And now that sports betting is so prevalent, the odds will be so against that. If you bet a dollar and they actually won, you'd probably win $200 million. <laughs> to think about, Crazy. in theory, then practically, I guess. The final tournament is the, the big one. Like, what if we could find the best team in Europe? And I don't mean like each country gets a team. That's the European championship that happens every four years. This I'm talking about the league clubs. So the best teams in, from all over Europe, from 55 different countries, battle it out each year. This is the UEFA Champions League. So as a side note on these acronyms here, FIFA is the organization that runs like big international tournaments, like the World Cup, and they help to coordinate things across different regions. If you're don't forget, once again, I will be getting FIFA 25 and be playing it on Twitch. I will upgrade it. I will upload it to some YouTube play as well. Uh, and don't forget, man, we are watching Premier League highlights over on Patreon. Link in the description, man. Check it out. I'm funny. They're funny. Me learning on the fly like this is it's, it's great for me. And it's very entertaining for y'all. If you're an American, you probably heard of FIFA because somebody on SportsCenter mentioned somebody that was involved with some kind of corruption investigation or something. Anyway, within FIFA, the world is divided into six different regions. UEFA is Europe. That's where like the best players go. CONCACAF, you may have heard of because that's what the U.S. is in, the Confederation of North. No, I've never heard of CONCACAF. Never heard of UEFA, but I've always, obviously, Europeans good at soccer i know that football central american and caribbean association football which is short and sweet and then there's like who's the best american footballer to ever do it is david beckham that's our goal don't even feel right david beckham like the rest of the world and each one of these Groups has tournaments with national teams and their league clubs like the CONCACAF Champions League and the UEFA Champions League. And these are called like the Champions League, but really it's just a tournament. So the UEFA Champions League is played in conjunction with the UEFA Europa League, which is kind of like the NCAA and NIT basketball tournaments, but with a bit of a twist. They play the qualifying rounds for the Champions League first. So if you get knocked out of the big boy tournament, but you finish high enough, you can just move down into the Europa League. and try That doesn't seem fair. Try to win that. And I won't get into the qualifying, but typically you're going to have teams that you may have heard of as, a, as an American, like Manchester City, Liverpool, Manchester United, Tottenham Hotspur. From Spain, they'd probably be Barcelona and Atletico Madrid and Real Madrid. Serie A from Italy will have Juventus and Inter and Roma and Atalanta. I have never heard any of these Italian teams. Maybe the, no, no German team. Germany is pretty much dominated by Borussia Dortmund and Bayern Munich. And then there's other popular teams like Paris Saint-Germain from France and Lyon from France and Ajax from the Netherlands. And then you throw in a few Russian teams and you're ready to party. So back to the Premier League. You remember how your team's playing that kind of standard 38-game schedule. So now, also at the same time, you're competing in the Premier League, the Carabao Cup, the FA Cup, and the Champions League. And there's like a bunch of other small one-off games happening too. So even if you... I feel like football is year-round year though. Like even if you're in the Premier League, like you're probably a part of another league that does not run concurrent somewhere else, right? Correct me if I'm wrong, I don't know. ...have the best team, you're still probably not going to win all these tournaments just because of the wear and tear. If you can win three trophies in a year, that's like special. That's called a treble. If you win four, that's called a quadruple, but that's pretty rare. And so the biggest... It's not rare. But somebody like me on the team, you easily win in what? One, two, three, four. Oh, FA, FA five. You know what I'm saying? 
It's not rare. You just need to write. You need to write talent. Generational, probably. Such as. Payday is for winning your league. Although I, for some reason, find the Champions League is hard to beat for excitement. So even though you can, soccer teams tend to trade players less than they do in the U.S. Rather, teams will just buy players from their current club. So a contract is going to include your salary, obviously, but also something called a release clause, which is a fee that would go to the current club for that player. So while any team could negotiate a transfer fee with a player's current club, a release clause takes that current team just out of negotiations altogether. So a baseball player... That's, that's, that's honestly negativity. Like, if you got beef with a team and you just want to beat them so bad, you could just go buy their best player before the game. Like, yeah, I'm going to cop your best player, and ain't nothing you could do about it. <laughs> that's tough. Player, unhappy with the situation, he could demand a trade, and they might trade him and he'd be happy. But if they refuse to trade him, then he's kind of stuck. Whereas a soccer player could just find another team willing to pay that release clause. And once a team agrees to pay the clause, then they can just negotiate directly with that player. Obviously, the better player, the higher the fee is going to be, so the current club can go out and find a reasonable replacement. Another big difference is that while most sports in the U.S. have a trade deadline, and that's followed by a few weeks afterward where players cannot move to another team, soccer is kind of the opposite. So most of the time, you cannot move to another team. There are two periods a year called transfer windows that you can move oh. to one. So usually before and then halfway through the season. And you can sign a new contract for another team whenever, but you can't actually start playing for them until that next transfer window. But that would be crazy, though, if you could sign a new contract, but you can't actually start playing with them. Like, that would be a bad, terrible locker room environment, right? So right now in England, Premier League, you're cooked. you got to wait all the way until January if you want to release somebody or do something with somebody. And the last thing in terms of contracts is that in the U.S., most leagues have a draft, but soccer is pretty much like the Wild West. So teams will sign players, or I should say kids, like into their youth academy very young, like 10, 8 years old. And smaller teams who find a really good player could also include something called a sell-on clause when selling a player to a larger team that says if the team buying that player turns around and sells the player again to an even bigger club, they get a percentage. Then that original team will get a percentage. I'm not mad of at that. that. Secondary. I did not knock a hustle. Sale. All right, so if you're still here at this point, you probably want more. So what's next? There are like an unlimited number of top or best goal compilations on YouTube, which are kind of interesting in this great team. Alone at time, it has lots of international. Um, you you probably want to learn a little more. About no lie, I do feel like I, I I'm, I'm a bit a little bit more adept to watching and understanding what's going on after watching this. Um, Premier League started last week. Um, and they, I think they play Fridays, Saturdays, and sometimes Mondays and Sundays. Uh, if I can, as soon as the highlight, the game is done, I'll get the highlights out on Patreon, link underneath the description. Um, if not, they'll be out the next day for sure. Let me know in the comments your favorite team. Let me know your favorite chant. Let me know what's going on, man. And I feel like, if I'm being quite honest, I'm such a sports person you know i'm so adept to this i feel like i already get it i got it all kind of